As we gather this morning, I invite you to lift your voices together and sing. There is Good morning and welcome to our combined worship service. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us and a special welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online on behalf of Rhonda uh, Berlin, our music director, and assisting us with worship today, Olivia Cornwell, uh, as well as our technical crew, Lori Costello and Cheryl Martucci. We are indeed glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. <clears throat> I do have a few uh, quick announcements uh, before we prepare ourselves for worship. Um, on the table in the back, and Linda Eckerd will be back there after worship to hand these out to you if you have not already uh, received or taken your copy of uh, this narrative budget that we have produced for you. And if you know of someone, so perhaps a family member or a friend, who is not here and you could take theirs and give it to them, that would really be helpful because these are sort of expensive to mail and so we are trying to save cost. So please make sure you get yours and uh, please take some for others who you may uh, be in contact with during the coming week and that would be very helpful for us. Um, today we begin Vacation Bible School this evening. It's not too late to register, so if you have not registered yet or you know of someone who still needs to register, please uh, do so. You can do so um, through the, the new church app uh, or the QR code that you find uh, on the back of your worship guide, uh, or uh, you can also do so uh, on paper. But please register, and uh, we begin that this evening. Also, please remember to register for the Women's Spiritual Retreat, which takes place September the 16th uh, through the 18th. Um, that, is, that will take place at Olmsted Manor, and that will be led by Reverend Connie Hooker. Um, also, a reminder, there is a, still a staff position open for a ministry technology coordinator. If you are interested in that, it's a very part-time position uh, to help us with all of this new technology that we are engaged with now so that we can bring worship as well as other church events to you online. If you are interested or know of someone who is interested in that, please uh, take an application, take a job description. They are located in the uh, mailbox bin that's located outside of my office 
If you are online and you would like that information, please uh, email the church office or call us, and we'll make sure that you get a copy of, uh, of that email to you. And now let us prepare ourselves for worship with these gathering words. God has called us together for this time of worship. Let us open our hearts to the one who gives us life. Let us set our faith and hope in God. God's promises to us are ancient and ever new. God is with us here and on all the roads we travel. Together we lift our voices and in songs of praise, let us worship. I invite you to stand if you are able and join us in singing Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Let us pray together. Christ, you meet us as we, we walk, walk on the roads of life. life. You, you reveal many things to us. You call, call us to change our lives and to, and to depend, depend on you. You, you teach us the greatest, deepest mysteries and reveal the truth of your, your promised, promised grace. grace. Open our eyes to recognize, recognize your, your presence. presence. Open our ears to hear you, and open our hearts to burn with your truth, so that mutual love may burst forth among all people here on earth. Amen. You may be seated. We now have a special time uh, to recognize our graduates. We have quite a few graduates um, from our congregation, either graduating from high school or college, um, or even from graduate school. And so this is a special time in our congregation where we have this wonderful opportunity to recognize them. So uh, if you are here, graduate, when your name is called and your bio is read, if we have that information, would you please come forward and stand here and face the congregation? Our first graduate is Mandy Berlin, daughter of Ken and Rhonda Berlin, granddaughter of Gloria and Hal Morgan, and sister to Katie Berlin. During high school, she participated in band, orchestra, and the musicals. She was the drum major of McDowell Marching Band, president of the media club, and recently finished an internship at WQLN. She plans to attend Penn West University in Edinburgh and major in strategic communications with a focus in digital media. Our, our next graduate is Kirsten Edwards, 
daughter of Corey and John Edwards and sister of Caden Owens and Alexandria and Jace Edwards. In high school, she was a cheerleader and worked in media. She is very artistic and she works hard at Tim Hortons and loves to volunteer at our neighbor's place every winter season. Her future plans are to join her brother Caden at Robert Morris University in Pittsburgh and study journalism with future plans to attend law school. Our third graduate is Jocelyn Hoover, daughter of Jennifer Wilson and sister to Michael and Caleb Hoover. In high school, she was involved in soccer and softball. She is active in the church youth group and has attended mission trips and Spark. Jocelyn plans to attend Slippery Rock University for recreational therapy, pre-occupational therapy, then go to grad school to get her doctorate in occupational therapy. Our next graduate is Cassie Rowdybush, daughter of Carolyn Rowdybush and granddaughter of Bonnie Hammer. She was also graduated from the Erie County Tech School. She likes painting, volleyball, family time, and campfires. She plans to attend Mercyhurst University to study and become a crime scene investigator. Next, we have Delaney Walker, daughter of Barb and Frank Walker, sister of Carson Walker. In high school, she was involved in the Academic Sports League and Unified Track. She likes hiking, swimming, and reading, and plans to attend Penn West University in Edinburgh this fall to major in speech, path in speech pathology. These are our high school graduates. And now for our college graduates. Sasha Carroll is the daughter of Alan and Becky Carroll, sister of Alexandra, Sai, and Zeke Carroll, and graduated from Gannon University with a degree in occupational therapy. Next, we have Michaela Cedor, daughter of Michael Cedor, sister of Madison Cedor, graduated from Gannon University in December with a degree in nursing, where she was in the National Honor Society and part of Phi Eta Sigma sorority. She has previously participated in both the Appalachian Service Project and One by One to Jamaica mission trips with our church. She likes going out with friends and campfires. She is currently working at St. Vincent's Hospital in Erie, but has future plans to relocate to North Carolina to join her mom, grandmother, and sister and, and pursue becoming a nurse practitioner with a specialty in neonatal intensive care and emergency services. And Rachel Hall graduated from graduate school. Rachel Hall, daughter of Bobby and Lori Hall, granddaughter of Body Hammer, and sister to Wyatt, Wes, and Lydia Hall, graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with her master's degree. And finally, we have Rachel Peer, daughter of Amy and Cliff Peer, sister of Brad Peer. Graduated from Penn State University at Barron in December of 2021. While in college, she was the president of the RAC Club, which is Random Acts of Kindness, secretary of Project and Supply Chain Management Club, and a Lion Scout tour guide. Rachel began working for General Motors Corporation in Warren, Michigan, in the Global Purchasing and Supply Train Track Program in February 2022 and has relocated to Detroit, Michigan. Congratulations to all of our graduates. And I want to share with you that uh, this particular group of graduates has a special place in my heart because out of the nine of them, seven of them have come through our recent confirmation classes. So I have had this opportunity to watch them grow up from, from being children to youth to young adults. And that is indeed a privilege and an honor. And so now I would like to pray for all of our graduates, and I'd like you to, uh, I know we can't all come up here and lay hands on them, but you can extend your hands out towards them 
so that we can pray for them. And there are four of you here. We can, yeah, we can, we can gather together and then we can lay hands on you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> God of truth and knowledge, by your wisdom we are taught the way and the truth. We ask, oh God, that you bless these graduates from high school, from college, and from graduate school. As they finish, have finished this, their courses of study and are now on to the next chapter of their young lives, we thank you for those who taught and worked beside them and all who supported them along the way. We ask, oh God, that you walk with them as they leave and move forward in life. We ask, God, that you take away their anxieties, their confusion of purpose, and that your spirit might be upon them. Give them your strength, your energy, your wisdom, and your guidance as they move forward according to your ways. And we pray this all in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Thank you, and congratulations. Let's give them another round of applause. And now I invite all the children up for a children's message. are you guys today? Good? Thumbs up? Okay, good. So I have a little thing here that I think you might know what it is. I'll grab one. What are these? They're worms. They're gummy worms, right? And are these little guys stretchy? Yeah, they're super stretchy. So this little guy is made out of <laughs> gelatin and sugar. So we can pull him and stretch him out a little bit. But if we pull him too hard, what will happen? He'll rip, he'll break, right? Yeah, you gotta be gentle with him. So the Bible says, yet you, Lord, are our, are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So we're the clay and God's the father, or the potter, excuse me, and the father. So he molds us into, into what he wants us to be, into our purpose, right? So if he didn't, the clay would remain a lump and not useful for anything. So let's see how far we can stretch this worm. Do you want to stretch it? Stretch it super, super far. How far can you go before it breaks? Oh, that was pretty far, right? Yeah, you, you can eat it now. <laughs> so that stretched pretty good, but we broke it because we were too hard, and it didn't really turn into anything, right? It was just a longer worm. But, because I'm, we're not very good potters like God is. But when God stretches us and molds us, he makes us into something awesome, and he promises that he'll never break us. So when you're going through a tough time, just remember that God promised he won't break you. So anything you're going through, you can make it through with God, right? Perfect. <laughs> you can have another one if you want. There you go. You want one? You want one? No. Okay, so let us pray together. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you that you brought all of us together today. Father God, we thank you for being the potter and molding us into your image, and we thank you so much for your promise to never break us. In your holy name we pray, amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke 24, 13 through 35. Now on the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place these days? He asked them, What things? They, repli they replied, The things about the Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did, not, they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which, he, to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found eleven, the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told us what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of God for the people of God. So I have some fond memories of my father-in-law. And one of the things is around meals. I've, I've talked to you often about the differences between Connie's family and my family when it comes to meals. I've talked about the difference uh, in the time it takes to eat a meal, where my family was very fast and, and her family, sometimes a meal would take three hours. I've talked about the difference uh, between the portions or the slices of pie and cake between our families. And I've talked somewhat about the uh, different things that we eat. Today I want to expand upon that a little bit. So when I was growing up in my family, we ate a lot of international foods, a lot of international meals. Because we lived in different countries and we traveled to different countries, I never knew when I was growing up what was going to be for dinner. Was it going to be an Indonesian dish or a Dutch dish? Was it going to be Spanish or American or some other nationality? I never knew because it changed from day to day. And it appeared that these, all these types of food really had nothing in common with one another, not a, a common element. The closest thing might have been rice. A lot of them had rice in it, but not all of them. 
On the other hand, when I started dating Connie, and I was invited to her, her home, her parents' home for dinner, I discovered very quickly that there was a common element in every meal. Can you guess what that is? Bread. Yeah, bread. Bread had to be at every meal, even if bread did not belong with the meal. For, for example, when we were dating, my, my parents invited her family over to our house for dinner. And my mom prepared an Indonesian dish. Bread does not go with in that Indonesian dish. But her, Connie's family loved that dish so much, they wanted to learn how to make it. So my mom gave them the recipe and, and, and gave them some hints of how to make it. And so they went home and they prepared that particular dish. But they served bread with it. Even though bread didn't belong with it, they had to have bread. And that was primarily because of the insistence of Connie's dad, my father-in-law. Bread had to be at every meal. And I learned through the years why that was the case. As he told me the same stories many times, and like a good son-in-law, I listened <laughs> in very intently. But one of the things he told me was that he grew up during the Depression, and his family was very poor. And so on Sundays, his mother would bake several loaves of bread, and that was their food for the entire week. They would eat bread for every meal the entire week, sometimes with coffee. They'd make coffee soup, but bread was it. Bread is what sustained them through these hard times. And so he told me that he wants bread at every meal because it reminds him that he was sustained by bread during difficult times. And he wants to know that his family is being sustained by bread. So bread had to be at every meal. <clears throat> I talked to you two weeks ago about the Israelites wandering around in the desert wilderness and how God provided manna for them in order to sustain them. And then last week we talked about Jesus proclaiming to be the bread of life, this life-giving bread that sustains us even today. Today, however, I think bread has become more of an accessory to many people. You know, when you go to a restaurant, you, before you even order your meal, there is a basket of bread out there for you to, to munch on, to kind of hold you over until, until your meal comes. And, but you have to be careful not to fill up on it. And people who are on diets, often one of the first things they cut out is bread because of the starches and the carbohydrates, and those aren't good for you, and so they cut out bread. But here's my question for you this morning. Is communion an accessory to worship? Communion, we receive this one of the elements called bread which represents Christ, Christ's body, making us the body of Christ so that we can be out in the world to be the body, act as the body of Christ. Life-sustaining bread. So I ask you again, is communion an accessory to worship? This account from uh, Luke, the, the well-known passage of the, the road to Emmaus, the walk to Emmaus that Olivia, <clears throat> excuse me, Olivia read for you this morning, is for us a model of worship. It is a model of balanced worship, a worship that entails word and table. 
Now, today, we have made communion more of an accessory to worship in many cases. And we hear, we have heard these throughout history, actually, these, these comments from people. Well, it takes too much time in worship. Well, it, it uh, reduces the reverence of it or the specialness of it. Or it's too routine. But also throughout history, theologians throughout history, even to today, will come back and counter with the following. You say it takes too much time. Do you not have time for God? You have time for other things. We have time to watch a three to four hour sporting event or a two to three hour movie or a concert. We have time to work eight to 12 hours a day, but we don't have time for God. As to the routine, well, you know, we eat physical meals in a routine manner. We eat it, we eat, we need to eat every day to maintain our, our energy, our strength. And when we skip a meal, when we don't eat, we get irritable and we get weak. We lose our energy and we need to eat. Routine is good. Routine eating is good. And the same th thing can be said about our spiritual lives. We need that routine. We need to eat. We need to come to the table on a regular basis for nourishment, for strength, so that we don't get weak in our faith so that we don't get irritable in our faith. And so we need that routine. Routine is good. And when it comes to losing reverence or specialness, John Wesley had this to say about that. He says, actually, the opposite is true. It shouldn't lose its reverence. It should increase. The reverence should increase. The more you celebrate the Eucharist, the more reverent it becomes because you are entering into the holy. Now, some would say, well, okay, we'll come, we, we celebrate communion, but we really don't feel worthy. But communion, Eucharist, is a means of grace. It is free, it is unmerited grace of God, the way God shows love. And when it comes right down to it, none of us are worthy, and none of us are worthy of any other means of grace that God provides. But God still wants us to participate, and God still wants us to celebrate that Eucharist. You know, when Jesus celebrated with his disciples in that upper room, he intended for it to be celebrated frequently because he didn't want people to forget. He wanted people to remember God's grace, God's love. He expected it to be celebrated often. So here are these disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
they're walking along the road, they're kind of distraught, they're, they're walking along somberly, they've just lost their teacher, their master, their leader, and they've lost hope, they've lost all hope, and they wonder what's going to happen now. But a stranger comes along, we all know that it's Jesus, but they didn't recognize him. And this stranger comes along and asks them, hey guys, what are you talking about? What's up? And they're like kind of appalled that you, you haven't heard what's going on in the news? All the stuff that's going on, you didn't hear the news or watch the, the evening news? You didn't get the latest Twitter feed? You don't know what's going on? Well, let us tell you what's going on. And so they begin to share everything that they know. But this stranger, who is Jesus, tries to enlighten them through the scriptures, tries to set them straight, tries to let them know this is what was supposed to happen. But they are still in a fog, and they're still confused. And then, once they get to a place they need to stay for the night, they are still confused, but they know this stranger is up to something, and they, they need him to stay. And so they urge him to stay. This stranger becomes their guest. They urge him to stay. Are you urging Jesus to stay with you? to be in his presence, to be in your presence. And then, of course, when he breaks the bread, suddenly they recognize him, and they go out and tell others. This is a model of worship for us, what we call the full, fourfold order of worship. If you have a copy of, a, of the worship guide, you can see on there that we have gone back to, we used to do this before pandemic. We, I would put this in, in the worship guide, in the bulletin, and then we got away from it for a while, but now I'm returning back to that to remind us of this fourfold order of worship. And you see it in your worship guides. You can see it on the screen there. Worship starts with gathering. We gather. And then we grow through the word of God. And then we respond. And then we are sent. We are sent out into the world. So let's take a look at those for, for a moment. You know, we come here, we come to this worship space from our busy lives. We're filled with anxieties, with concerns, maybe with grief, pain. Some come here with joy and want to celebrate something, but others come here with all kinds of struggles. But Jesus meets us here. In fact, Jesus is here before us and invites us in. That's when we gather. And then we gather to praise and honor God. But he also knows that we need some training. We need to learn. We need to grow in our faith. We need to grow closer to God. And so we have the scriptures which are proclaimed through the children's message, through the adult message, through the reading of the word. And through that, God is revealed to us. God's purposes are revealed. And God teaches us how to be more Christ-like, how to live our lives. So we're learning and we're growing in that discipleship. But the word proclaimed always requires a response. And so we respond in many different ways. Our typical responses has been, have been our prayers, 
our liturgies, our offerings, and communion or the Eucharist. You know, we have three interchangeable terms that we use for, for, the, for communion. We, we call it the Lord's Supper. We call it communion. We call it the Eucharist. The Lord's Supper is really signifying that remembrance of what happened in that upper room. Remembering the sacrifice made for us. And communion is this, this mystical union with Christ. Where we are united with Christ and Christ with us. And Eucharist means thanksgiving. It's an offering of thanksgiving for all that God has done and all that God is. Thanksgiving as we remember what Christ has done for us, the sacrifice. Thanksgiving for Christ's presence here and now. And so communion is one of those responses that are really important. Because just like these disciples on the road to Emmaus, our eyes are sometimes shut. Or our vision is clouded. We don't see clearly. We don't understand what God is trying to show us. How God is trying to reveal God's self to us. So we need something. To have our eyes and our hearts opened. So when we respond, we respond at the table, like these disciples. When, you know, when Jesus took this, used this, this uh, formula, this, uh, this cherished formula of taking, blessing, breaking, and giving, a formula that he used in that upper room, a formula that he used when he was feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000 and, and other events and other opportunities for meals. So they recognized this formula. And when he used that, they knew whose presence they were in. It opened their eyes. And suddenly they began to understand what he was teaching them in the scriptures. And suddenly they began to understand what they were supposed to do. In the same way, our eyes are open. When we come to the table, that cloudy vision, the scriptures where God is revealed to us are suddenly open to us. You know, sometimes we hear these scriptures and we don't understand. And sometimes we think, well, man, nah, that's, that's really for somebody else. That's not for me. But when we come to the table, we recognize we are in Christ's presence. And we recognize that God is trying to teach us, each of us, individually, what God wants to reveal to us. And so we come to the table to be nourished, to be strengthened. To have our eyes opened and our hearts burning. And like the disciples... You notice what happens as soon as they recognized they were in the presence of Christ? They had to run. They couldn't wait. It was dark already. And they had to run and tell others that they had been in the presence of the resurrected Christ. They had to go and tell. They had to share. And so it is with us. The fourth component of our fourfold worship is sending. We are sent. We are sent out into the world to be and do for others what Jesus Christ has been and done for us. Where have you heard that before? We are sent to serve and to share just like those disciples. And that is our fourfold order of worship. <clears throat> you know, worship is our highest priority on Sundays. 
There's no question about it. But worship needs to be balanced. And that requires this fourfold order of worship. It's about worship of word and table. It's a vital component. Communion is not an accessory to worship. It's a vital component of balanced worship. One of the things that those disciples needed is they needed to be refocused to be more Christ-centered. And so do we. We come here with all of our baggage. And so often, we need to be refocused on what is really important. We need to refocus ourselves and be more Christ-centered. And that's why communion is so important to us, because it helps us to refocus. One final note about it, though, is it's not the somber event that we often make it out to be. Communion, or let's call it the Eucharist, is an opportunity for thanksgiving. We give thanks to God. We give thanks to God for who God is and who God has made us to be, for God's purposes in our lives, and for revealing God's self to us. So it is an offering of thanksgiving to God. And that is worthy of joy and celebration as we celebrate at the table. A little girl coming to church once said it best, I think. She said, celebrating the Eucharist is like walking into the heart of God. When you come to the table, you are walking into the heart of God. When you receive the elements of the bread and cup, you are walking into the heart of God. And when you walk into the heart of God, then you too receive energy and strength to bring God's love into the world. You are empowered. So at the table, we celebrate being the body of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ, so that we can enact being the body of Christ out in the world. So when we are dismissed, we too should run and tell, run and serve and share, making disciples of Jesus Christ. So will you walk into the heart of God? Will you be empowered to share God's love? Then come to the table. Amen. One of our responses, in addition to celebrating the Eucharist, is to share our joys and concerns, to share our prayers, as well as our offerings. So you have shared these prayer concerns with us this morning. Uh, first, a note that the candle on the altar is in memory of Ruth Barton, a member of this congregation um, who passed away this past week. She lived at, at, at Westbury. So our... Christian sympathy is extended to Ruth's family. There is a praise for the church family and a prayer for the staff and children of this week's vacation Bible school. Prayers for Laura as she makes an important decision. Prayers for a coworker whose son passed away in a car accident. Prayers for a friend, Joanne, having hip replacement this week. And prayers for Joe Bellin, uh, whose health is declining. He is in Hammett Hospital. Let us then turn to God in prayer this morning. O oh, glorious and ever-loving God, 
we come to you with rejoicing and celebration. We come to you with our anxieties and our pain. We come to you from all different walks of life and all kinds of circumstances that we have experienced, both good and bad. And so here we are, God, we've gathered. You have revealed yourself to us. And now we are here to respond through our prayers and our offerings and at your table. It is good always to be in worship and to use this worship to refocus our lives and to recenter ourselves on you, Lord. Especially in a world that offers us so much individualism and consumerism, it is good to be here and be in your presence and to focus on you. We celebrate being a church family. We celebrate being your family, and we celebrate, God, your grace and your love and your calling. As we come to you this morning, there are some concerns that we have shared that are on our hearts, and so we lift these up to you. We lift up in particular Joe Bellin, Joanne, a co-worker whose son passed away, and Laura and her decisions, and the Vacation Bible School, the staff and, and the children, and all that will happen during these next few evenings. We turn these all over to you, Lord, and ask for your guiding presence and your guiding direction. We ask that you bless and care for all of these folks. Lord, we pray for the situations that we are surrounded in, in our community and in the world. The situations of unrest and disruptions to our lives. The situations of war in other countries specifically in Ukraine. We pray for your peace, and we pray for world leaders that they may come to you, Lord, and get to know you first, and that they might know your peace and lead their people towards peace. And that we pray, O oh God, that as your faithful followers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we might be more Christ-like and might represent you out in the world, being the model of your peace, your love, your compassion, and your care for everyone whom we encounter. And we pray this all in the matchless and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, we respond to God through our offerings, a God who guides and sustains us, a God who sends us out into the world, into the world to attend to the needs of others. Where there is enmity or suffering or spiritual or physical poverty, may we become channels through which the Holy Spirit acts. And when we give, when we present our offerings, we extend our influence and God's love and compassion beyond our reach, our own reach. So let us give thankfully and generously to God. And we can present those gifts either through electronic means, through the QR code of Kindred Giving, or through the church app through our website, or we can mail in the offering envelopes to the church office or deposit them in the offering plate that is located at the entry exit to this worship space. Let us then offer up a prayer of thanks. We thank you, O oh God, for all of the ways in which you call us and the gifts that you have provided us with. And so now we offer a portion of that back to you so that your work may be accomplished in this world. 
so that we might reach and your, that your love may reach beyond these four walls into the community and into the world so that we may faithfully represent you. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. So blessed are you, O God, who with your word and the Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. And in Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new on the night before meeting with death that Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which will be given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance, <clears throat> and on when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, the means in which Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And so now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
turning from your seats and then partaking uh, as you are ready. There is also a gluten-free option. 